Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the People's Health Dispatch interview this week. Today we are joined by Thiru Balasubramanian, who is a well-known health activist known to follow up on the issues of research and development, intellectual properties, and their influence on access to medicines and medical products. Today, Thiru will be talking to us about the recently concluded WIPO assembly, the general concerns on issues of intellectual property rights, and the recent session of Human Rights Council that adopted a resolution on access to medicines, vaccines, and other health products. Thank you, Thiru, for joining us. Thank you, Gargaya. Uh, you know, in the last two years, uh, uh, you know, we have been talking a lot about uh, intellectual property rights. And there have, there have been many campaigns on the issue of intellectual property rights as a barrier to accessing medical products, in particular in the COVID pandemic. Uh, in the recent times. Do you see any change in the working and the position of organizations such as WIPO, which have been created to protect and promote intellectual property, towards uh, the agenda of equity and development? So I think uh, that's a very good question, Gargaya. So I think um, but it um, deserves a um, considered and perhaps complex response. But I think one thing to note about WIPO is that, just for people who might not know about it, it is the uh, it stands for the World Intellectual Property Organization, and it is a specialized agency of the United Nations. And just for example, how the World Health Organization is tasked with, um, let's say, promoting and safeguarding public health. Uh, WIPO is the UN agency that uh, is uh, was basically created and to uh, basically uh, promote and uh, protect intellectual property. And um, as I understand, it only actually became a UN agency in 1967. Uh, prior to that, it was more of a private organization. It's quite interesting to see is that over the last decade or so, you've seen WIPO engage in this so-called trilateral cooperation with WTO and WHO. So in that context, yes, you could say that um, they've probably um, engaged in some work in, um, uh, in the COVID-19 response. Uh, however, I can point you to a time very early on in, uh, well, in the COVID uh, pandemic actually at the end of 2020 uh, in December, let's say, uh, and there was a meeting of the Standing Committee on the Law of Patents, and you know one of the uh, standing items they discuss is the issue of patents and health, and this was about two months after uh, India and South Africa introduced their proposal for a TRIPS waiver at the WTO, uh, and I remember um, the delegate from Zimbabwe being very frustrated uh, in one of the discussions saying, you know, why, why are we watching? There's a feeling that we're watching at the sidelines where our colleagues at WTO are um, really engaging. So in that sense, uh, you know, there is a perception that perhaps certainly WIPO could do more. In the recently held w, uh, WIPO assembly, there has been discussion for an agreement on intellectual properties, genetic resources, and traditional knowledge associated with genetic resources. Could you elaborate on what this is and you know, will, is there a chance that it will improve access to various uh, products and various is, uh, you know, uh, sectors, including the medical and health related uh, issues? Yeah, I think I would want to be yeah, quite careful in answering that. So. With respect to accessing medical products, I think that's a tough one. I think uh, one to answer. I think generally the sort of concerns that many developing countries have with respect to genetic resources or associated traditional knowledge is, you know, in many instances, um, what this instrument would seek to do would be to create a mandatory disclosure requirement whereby if I was a patent holder or some sort of prospector or something, if I went to the Amazon or, you know, some 
<clears throat> region, especially in the developing world, um, if I was uh, applying for patents and it derived from these genetic resources that in the patent application, he would say, this is derived from a genetic resources resource based in uh, Uganda or Kerala or, you know, um, and um, actually in this negotiation, typically I, uh, it's kind of interesting. So countries like, uh, I would say developed countries such as Australia and New Zealand, maybe I think partly because of uh, their home to, you know, a sizable indigenous population, they've been actually more sensitive uh, to these demands of developing countries, because I should say this, that in a lot of these negotiations, it's not just developing countries who are the demanders. Often times it's uh, indigenous community, local communities and indigenous peoples who are uh, pushing for this. And um, uh, so there's this issue about whether this disclosure requirement, sh should it be mandatory or not? And so I would, even in a country like Switzerland, I think, you know, which is a home to large pharmaceutical companies, I think they're actually supportive of it. It's, I think there's really one major holdout, I would say, and that would be the United States of America. But uh, getting to what happened um, the last week, it was quite uh, remarkable, I would say, that basically, uh, this, as I, I mentioned to you, uh, this is something that's been on the, you know, been on the cards for at least two decades. And it was a, basically a proposal by the African group. What they sought to do was to link the work program uh, leading to a diplomatic conference for this, an instrument on uh, genetic resources and uh, associated traditional knowledge with something completely unrelated on a design law treaty. And that's something that has really um, been called for um, by many European countries, especially Central and European and the Baltic states. And so what they did was it was kind of a, you can crudely describe as horse trading, but they were smart. They linked two unrelated items and um, they basically, so basically in the work program of both, you see something like um, there should be a diplomatic conference no later than 2024. And sort of the political dynamic that sort of, uh, I would say uh, engendered this was the fact that uh, in the General Assembly and this, you hardly ever see, or at least I have hardly ever seen there were at least three votes, uh, all related with Ukraine, um, uh, about an item related to providing technical assistance to Ukraine. And because there was a lot of political capital used on that vote, then on this nor these normative items, the African group presented it. And even though like typically, because typically you need consensus, uh, but, um, and even if some countries were reluctant, then uh, the African group actually said, well, you know, they were very open to calling for a vote. And then countries buckled under that pressure, I would say. So that was a very well played. Uh, it is true, I should mention though, that the United States did not join consensus. However, they did not block it. So what that means, uh, I would say to our listeners is that the work is still going to go on and that um, it'll be, um, yeah, it, it could have quite a lot of implications. Uh, so I think it's something that, uh, let's say, the watchers and the people's health movement should maybe uh, engage in because it's going to uh, be quite a big deal. Going beyond the WIPO, we also see that there was a recent resolution on uh, access to medicines that was access to medicines, vaccines, and other health products at the Human Rights Council, which was adopted. Uh, could mm -hmm. you please uh, speak about this and why is it important? Because, you know, in Geneva, sure. we see uh, in the Geneva based UN agencies, we see, as I was already telling, it also looks like there is this increased understanding and awareness about the role of 
this public research and development and intellectual properties and access because we went through a, a round of huge vaccine inequity. Could you talk on this? At the Human Rights Council, there's a group called the Core Group, and I don't think many people know about it, uh, you know, unless you're following this quite closely. And this Core Group consists of the following countries: Brazil. China, Egypt, India, Indonesia, Senegal, South Africa, and uh, Thailand. And um, basically 20 years ago, prior to the um, Human Rights Council, there was this Human Rights uh, Commission, uh, you know, right around, like you mentioned 2001. So uh, right around that time, actually, the United States brought a WTO dispute case against Brazil on a local working requirement. And um, and actually, uh, this was around the time of Doha, just before Doha, and then um, and Brazil like uh, launched another case against uh, the United States. But one thing that was interesting, and it's like, I've done some research on it, and it was reported at the time, this initiative at the Human Rights Commission, it was in a way of sort of a softer way to build uh, sort, of, sort of support to this issue of uh, equity and access to medicines and bringing attention to the patent barriers. So fast forward to uh, 2022. So typically I would say um, from my memory, I think it's uh, about every three years, the core group brings a resolution on access to medicines and and at, to, at the Human Rights Council. And typically uh, at the Human Rights Council, things are adopted by consensus. Uh, and it's like, if there is a vote, that's not a good sign. Like really, like it's perceived as like, so if you're citing a document and it's one that had a vote, it doesn't carry the same weight. Uh, the Human Rights Council is very different, actually. And so if, let's say, uh, one has access to the Palais des Nations with the badge, um, yes, you can enter um, the, um, the informals. as They don't call them drafting groups. You can, but you can go to the informals and you can participate, like you can just observe and watch and say nothing. Or if you want to, you can even uh, raise your hand and say things. And so in 2016, I would just try to give you the context. The reason why it was such a contentious year was that it was the year that uh, in September 14th, uh, the UN uh, United Nations High Level Panel on Access to Medicines under Ban Ki-moon, that's when they released their report. But this was a few months earlier. So there, were, uh, there was a lot of tension about this report. And, uh, and it was quite amazing because this is the Human Rights Council, right? And yet there were negotiators. So, and I remember because I, I, in that particular time, I went to all three informals. And there was a part, uh, there, there was a passage when countries were quoting, um, the, let's say the core group, they had a reference to the impact of high prices and let's say patents or intellectual property on access. Well, what I remember is Switzerland actually, like said, let's strike that up. And uh, at, in 2016, so uh, then I raised my hand and I said, you know, something to, like this. I said, you know, it's interesting that, you know, trade ministers in 2001 were okay with this language. And at the Human Rights Council, there seems to be a problem. And so immediately after that, I think maybe because I mentioned Doha actually the member state Qatar raised their hand and said, we support what, what like this NGO said. And uh, I don't know if it was just about me, but like the point is at the end that reference uh, I believe was retained. Uh, but that's just to give you just one example of, you know, um, how contentious it was. And it was, um, you know, the EU and the UK in particular, I thought were quite bad in that particular um, uh, in, in that particular year. So this year, uh, you know, of course, you know, this is in the context of COVID. It was in, and it was also interesting because, you know, typically you expect, I expect at least there to be some contentious uh, 
parts about intellectual property, and which is interesting because the core group, they're not trying to reinvent the wheel or, you know, like they, they, they use existing language. They're very careful. And yet even then, um, uh, certain countries like the US and others were saying, you know, these selective quotations. Some new points of contention were this. Uh, so there was a part initially in the resolution that referred to international principle of international solidarity. And the European Union uh, objected to that, like quite. And what's fun that because, you know, that's kind of surprising because, you know, in the past, in the early days of the pandemic, the president of the, you know, like Ursula von der Leyen talked about solidarity. So that, that was kind of interesting. Um, oh, and then there was a very specific reference to in inequality and in inequity within and among states. And the EU really objected to that. They didn't want there to be a reference to discuss the inequality between and among states. So um, but I will say this one, one thing is that um, eventually, though, uh, this resolution was passed with, with consensus. So in that sense, I would say that was a, um, you know, that was a, uh, like to a an good, extent, really good at step. least acknowledging uh, and a step in the right direction that there is an issue here in yeah. the context of medicines and medical property. Uh, uh, as we come uh, a bit towards the you know closing or the end of this interview, you know, uh, can we rightly say that the last two years also brought serious discussions on I, you know, intellectual properties as a barrier? You know, you have been following these issues from the last. 20 odd years, uh, very keenly, and definitely a bit earlier also on the issues of medicines and trade and uh, patents and intellectual property. You know, how should we see this phase? Is there a renewal of activism, a renewal of push against you know these barriers that you know where profits are have been becoming more important than people's health and you know. How do you see, uh, not just technically, but more like as groups fighting on these issues? Yes, I would say that in terms of uh, bringing to the public for, um, certainly in the last two years, uh, in the just daily newspapers, not even specialist trade publications or health journals, it's true that this issue uh, of IP and access, you know, it's, you know, it's something that you know, now like you would have conversations with one's family or friends, people who, uh, you know, normally uh, wouldn't maybe get a bit bored about what, like, I don't know, but like suddenly, um, you know, it became, it highlighted like the structural inequities um, uh, that are brought to bear. So I think, whereas, it is true that I think there was some disappointment about the ministerial decision that was reached at the WTO on June 17th. Um, still, in terms of like the impact and the political uh, impact, I think um, you know, as uh, still the WTO is still um, trying to solve this issue about. Um, access to COVID countermeasures, including therapeutics and diagnostics. I think that it's really, um, in terms of public consciousness, it's, uh, even though this has been a horrible period and for our humanity and for health systems, for economies and society, uh, at least it's, um, you know, I guess one silver lining is that, um, you know, it can help activists sort of um, galvanize uh, our work in terms of trying to uh, fight for equity and uh, reform um, uh, the incentives for R&D. Thanks a lot, Piru. Uh, we do have a lot of homework to do. And I'm sure uh, organizations like KEI and yourself actually are very uh, helpful and useful in breaking down these very complex structures that sometimes are not so easy to understand. Uh, 
and on this note we'll be ending this interview thank you so much thank you Thank you.